So it is November 26, 2017. Our message this morning is called Saints Such as These. I want to start with you today in Isaiah 42. We're going to begin in verse 13. It was unplanned, but it came to me during the worship service, and I want to encourage you with what the Lord is encouraging me with. Beginning in verse 12. <laughs> Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise in the islands. The Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. For a long time, somebody say long time. Long time. I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now... Like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and the hills and dry up their vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn darkness into light before them and rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. I want to tell you, LCM, the living God will not forsake you. He is with us. You can feel his presence in our services. In the midst of these trials, as the prophecy during worship said, he is refining us. He is shaping us. It goes without saying that it has been a long, hard fight to get here. From 2002 until now, we've known and participated in and won many battles. And we're not nearly through yet. This is not a time for our victory lap and extended celebration, but we are going to take a minute to be benefited by a quick glance at Goliath's sword. A brief moment with Samson's disposable jawbone. We're going to revisit the spot where we cross the Red Sea between the devil and the deep blue sea. In Wade's excellent message on Sunday, he began with us in Psalm 118. And I want to refresh that with you now. It's Psalm 118 and verse 6. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my easer. Helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. You hear a theme going on here this morning? From Isaiah 42 to Psalm 118, I will look in triumph upon my enemies. It's like the one pastor said when his service was interrupted. A man came barging down the aisle. He said, Pastor, do you remember me? You and I once had a fight pastor looked him in the eye and said, why don't you lay down so I can remember you how I left you last? <laughs> you can walk over, but you're going to limp back, devil. At LCM, we are not going to take it sitting down. We know what it is to advance the kingdom of God, and we've only just begun. Amen. Look at verse 13. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Like a super heavyweight with knockout power in his right hand. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. And so it is held high in triumph in the house of LCM. Today is a day when I want to take a minute to look backwards and see what he has accomplished. I want to look backwards so that we might be encouraged as we move forwards. The Lord has indeed done mighty things and it is marvelous in our eyes. Our ministry is turning out the finest apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers that I have ever seen. And each generation of them is growing in quality. We have made public more than 1,100 sermons 
that are being downloaded and streamed. At this point, we have materially and spiritually assisted in church plants in Virginia, Illinois, Louisiana, and Texas domestically. We're on our way to establishing lasting works in Indonesia and Peru. Somebody give the Lord a hand. The Middle East is in our view, and we are praying, planning, and preparing to liberate Ishmael's sons from their bondage to that satanic spirit of a pedophile prophet and his tyranny. We have set our eyes on Turkey and the ancient region of Aswan, and we will see salvation in those places. Amen. We are on pace right now to have invested $1 million in missions efforts between 2010 and 2020. Look around you. Let that sink in. That's a million dollars a hundred at a time, friends. In a church with 50 families in it, over 10 years, a million dollars into missions. That's what we're on pace to do. We have seen our barren women receive their children. If you're in here praying for children, look around you because most of the children in here are miracles in and of themselves. You will have your children. Amen. We have seen those desiring adoption come home with their sons. We know what it is to lose our loved ones and we have seen the dead raise in response to our request. Amen. How many churches can say that? That's not a metaphor. That's not a simile. We literally saw a dead woman come back to life for more than a week so that she could say goodbye to her relatives. We have faced the giants named gloom and despair, squared off and pummeled those posers like professional pugilists. I don't plan to let them regain their breath. I don't plan to let them get back on their feet. They will not partake in one more precious moment in my life. They are down and they are on their way out. Amen. With a renewed spirit, a righteous spirit that is rising in this place with a holy savagery towards the enemies of God, we will continue to fight and we will continue to win. Amen. This year alone, we completed Exodus, Joshua, and compiled a new advanced combat training for our next generation of kingdom takers. Our disciples are our proudest accomplishment in this church. How many of you have heard of Rashi? Yes. He was a Jewish scholar. He lived about 900 years ago. Rashi is not his name. It's merely a combination of three Hebrew letters. A resh, a shin, and a yod which stand for Rabbi Nainu Shlomo Yitzhak, or Rabbi Solomon, son of Isaac. Rashi is an acrostic abbreviation for a man's name, making sure to give proper recognition to his mentor, his father, Isaac. Rather than say Rabbi Solomon, son of Yitzhak, they simply say Rashi. That's important because of the kind of things that he taught. I want to give you a quote from Rashi that one of our disciples gave me this morning. He who raises his son, say he who raises, he who raises, he who raises his son to be righteous is like an immortal man. Oh, that is incredible. You may not care that Rashi said it, but you ought to care that Proverbs 20, 12, 28 says it. In the way of righteousness, there is life. Along that path, is immortality. Amen. When we raise righteous disciples, when we raise up sons and daughters, all that matters in a legacy is continued for as long as God lives. Friends, that's forever and ever and ever. Paul said it in Romans 2, 7 in this way. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. In every way that a church can be measured, LCM is actually gaining ground and excelling. When you are surrounded by saints such as these, it helps compel you towards greatness. When I think of what our disciples are accomplishing, 
No wonder every generation is getting better. You're pulled forward by those that have gone ahead of you. This year alone, say this year alone. This year alone. We went behind enemy lines three times in Turkey, suffering sickness and multiple arrests. We arrived unknown and unwanted, but we left with treasured invitations beckoning our return. The nation remains in turmoil, but Silatine of Tarsus, Toprak of Antioch, Cesar of Pontus, they've never been on better footing. And we will see the gospel established in their family line forever and ever. Somebody say amen. amen. In Romania, our brothers joined us in the fight. And their faith is better for it. They long for more visits and are eager for more participation in the conquest of Christ. These are just places we went this year. Our family in Kenya has prospered from the presence of meaningful discipleship and is learning to advance the kingdom one life, one family, and one nation at a time. Do you think it matters to the Ikugusi people? That somebody in Sugarland, Texas cares about them? Yes. Our brief foray into Malaysia has brought people into the Valley of Jehoshaphat and it's being followed by the LCM tribe stationed in Indonesia. Families are being baptized and new stands for Christ have been taken. Is that praiseworthy? Yes. Or should we celebrate a pastor's latest book on how to get spoiled rich and fat? When we reach across the battle lines into Iraq, mere miles from ISIS, our metal was tested with sickness and trial. Our devotion to the Lord and His cause carried us into the comfort of the Spirit, and we will return and win on that soil. I give you my word. Amen. This year after incursions into Peru, we decided that we can take Peru. The declaration was made... And our deeds followed our declaration. Buddy and Kim are holding meetings there this morning for the glory of our King. Somebody say amen. Our many trips into Mexico are reestablishing ministries, founding new families, and delivering captives from the enemy into the glorious light of the kingdom. Other churches are joining us, and vision, along with its power, is profoundly changing lives. What is that worth to a brother ministry in Louisiana? Their first missions trip. It's sparking new life everywhere. Amen. This year saw our 10th. Somebody say 10th. Yes. This year saw our 10th trip to India. And they have now expanded to 25 fire-filled, Holy Ghost-powered churches that are eager to join us in new arenas of work. This year, 300 saints descended upon Denham Springs, Louisiana, and the church there has obtained their property and fanned the flame of their vision. The unity of the One Association churches is no longer a theory. It's a kingdom reality. The arm of God is stretching not only across our nation, but across the seas, just as Elder Charlie saw it in the early 90s. Our two trips to Indonesia have seen our family there undergoing spiritual and physical trials. But they prevail by the holy fire of God. Amen. This morning, Teresa Vincent has an illness in her eyes. This morning, we're going to continue our struggle to satisfying victory. If the enemy has had the audacity to afflict Teresa... Can you see her eye in that picture? She lost all sight. Let's stand to our feet and remind him that we are of the spirit that restores sight to the blind. We are not going to take this sitting down because at LCM we are the liberators of oppression. Father, we stand here this day Trusting in your miraculous power. We will see your healing happen. And we will see it come quickly. In the name of Jesus, we demand sight into the eyes of Teresa. We tell you, you foul spirit of Islam. 
You will have no place in her. You will not stop the gospel. In the name of Jesus, she will see and others will see. Jesus, hear your people as we intercede with a victorious plea. Mighty God, we say move quickly as we stretch forward our hand. Lord God, let your hand touch her eyes now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Y'all take your seat and keep praying for Teresa. Listen, we stand here on Sundays and Wednesdays. We preach in our homes almost every day of the week. That is not the last picture we will show you of Teresa. You're going to see a picture of her eyes healed despite what the ophthalmologist says. Despite what the satanic spirit wants. In the name of Jesus, I will triumph because my Lord will triumph over our enemies. After two trips to Israel this year, I have never been more inspired by the Jewish people. They are the chosen, and they will prevail in their perilous times. I say that because we are of the same spirit as Israel. We share in the Ruach HaKodesh of their king. When Israel was formed as a nation in response to Isaiah 66 in verse 8, let me read that to you. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such things? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. In 1948, just prior to the War of Independence, Menachem Begin, he was then a military leader and he later became their sixth prime minister. He gave this rousing quote. I want to read it to you today. It's something of the spirit that I'm talking about. He says, we shall go into battle. Man, that's a step ahead of the rest of the church right there. We actually want to show up on the battle lines. We shall go into battle and we shall be accompanied by the spirit of millions of our martyrs. Our ancestors tortured and burned for their faith. Our murdered fathers and butchered mothers. Our murdered brothers and strangled children. And in this battle, we shall break the enemy and bring salvation to our people. Tried in the furnace of persecution, thirsting only for freedom, for righteousness, and for justice. Friends, there is a demonic work around the world. A satanic influence that is doing spiritual harm, spiritual violence to people everywhere. We are the sons of God and we are here to liberate people from demonic oppression. Yes. We are here to expand the kingdom of Christ and kick the devil out of what is ours. Yes. This earth belongs to the meek, those that are submitted to the almighty God. Yes. Well, a quote like this one is easily misunderstood, often mischaracterized, sometimes even maligned. I want you to know that I understand it. We've suffered too much, endured too long, and fought too hard to allow the enemy to gain ground now. Cowards sit behind their Facebook mouse, and they lob bombs at a distance. Those that are weak-hearted have fallen by the wayside. But the one thing that you cannot criticize this church for is its productivity. Whatever we are, whatever we have, Jesus is moving in this place in a way that is establishing his work around the world. If you can't accomplish your calling here, friend, where could you accomplish your calling? And I have no plan. Our pastors have no ch plan to change it now. During these kinds of moments, it's time to sacrifice the superfluous, eliminate the excess. We're buckling down for battle. Psalm 112 gives us assurance of the outcome, and the outcome is assured. Yes. Turn with me to Psalm 112. Yes. <clears throat> Look at verse 4. 
Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for the gracious and the compassionate and the righteous man. Where does light dawn? Even in darkness. Good will come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Surely he will never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered forever. How long? Forever. How long? Forever. You can ask yourself if what you're doing will matter in eternity. I can tell you that the community that you're a part of, what we're doing, it will be remembered forever because it is written in the heavens. He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is... His heart is... Church, we are not fickle. We are not wavering through unbelief because we have begun to believe that God is able to perform that which He has promised. Our hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure. He will have no fear. In the end, He will look in triumph upon His foes. He has scattered abroad His gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be lifted high in honor. Oh, let us come to the point, though. The wicked man will see and be vexed. He will gnash his teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. Here we have it, friends. Our wicked enemy will come to nothing. Even in darkness, our light dawns. We will look in triumph upon our foes. A righteous man will be remembered forever. That's it. There is either nothing in store or a memory that lasts for as long as God's kingdom lasts. Which would you prefer, nothing or the memory that is eternal? See, we're not just giving money to India. We've invested ten trips to India and three generations of saints and two, actually three, pastoral families. We're not just sending money. What we're doing is investing in lives that are changing the world. And India is going to join us in the Middle East, you mark my word. The Debar Yahweh, the Word of God, the Word becoming flesh, has been appearing to men since the dawn of the fathers of our faith's time. The Word of God reminds us that it can be trusted, that the Word is our shield. Turn to Genesis 15 and verse 1. We'll begin in the law. Abram, notice his name has not even been changed yet. I'm sorry, I skipped to verse 6 instead of verse 1. 15, 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Those of you unfamiliar with this passage in Hebrew, it is the Debar Yahweh. If you were going to say it in Greek, it would be Logos to Theos. The word of God appeared to Abram in a vision. Normally words don't appear. Normally you hear them, you do not see them. But something about the word of God appeared to Abram. And what was this great salvation message? Was it about propitiation for sin? Was it about how to expiate guilt? Was it how to surrender your life to a full-time call? Was it some other such church nonsense? No, it was practical. It was real. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. You don't need a shield if you're not in a war, friends. You don't need a shield if you're hiding behind your pillows. You don't need a shield if the boogeyman is under the bed. You need a shield when you're ready to fight. Amen. God has been calling men who will take on the enemy on his territory and reclaim it for God. And we are saints such as these. Look around you. Normal men, normal women, filled by a supernatural God, a paranormal God, someone who goes beyond just this creation and reaches in supernatural ways into your life with transforming power. We have a shield because we need a shield. The enemy is throwing darts. 
His puppets, the weak ones, they also throw darts. They do it from a safe distance because they're carnal cowards. But our God is not. He confronts a man in his situation right where he's at. And he says, deal with your fear because I will be your shield. You can trust in what you're scared of or you can trust in me. Oh, I and my household, we have chosen to take up the shield of faith. What do you have in your hands, friends? You ought to have a shield of faith and a sword of the Spirit. You ought to have on your feet the preparation of the gospel peace. Around your waist, a belt of truth. On your chest, a breastplate of righteousness. On your head, a helmet of salvation. You are a soldier of Christ. You are not a pancake for Christ. You are a war club, not a butter knife. We are saints such as these. Abraham is our father. He needed a shield because he was at war. And we have joined with the father of the faithful in the war of God. In Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. There may never have been a more beautiful verse than that one. I hate credit. There's a reason that I hate credit. In my earlier days, I abused it. I looked up and I had built a prison for myself, one of my own making. All of the people that I needed to pay now controlled my life. I was no longer free to go where I wanted to go and do what I wanted to do because I had to pay a car note and a truck note and a mortgage note and many other revolving accounts. How many of you feel me out there in the house of God? I began to take seriously the elimination of all credit except the one that counts. The one that counts is the God Almighty who looks and says, I see potential in you, son. I know you don't see it. That's why you're hiding in a wine press. I know you don't see it. That's why you call yourself a worm. But I'm telling you, I will change you. I will fill you, and I will attack the enemy and overcome through you. Amen. I am living proof that that is true. Pastor Sutherland and Pastor Piro are living proof that that is true. God took men of no account and no reputation, and look at what he has accomplished in the last few years, the last year alone, and he's doing it through your life right now. This is a day when you should hold your head high, we have been credited with victory before the victory has been given. Amen. You have been awarded a line of credit that you don't even have the ability to repay. You know, the problem with all of the other debt that I had is it also exceeded my ability to pay. But they were not merciful. They wanted my house. They wanted those cars. They wanted those things back, and the pressure of it caused this. <laughs> you know what our king has asked for in return for the credit that he extends you? Your courage at the battle line. Amen. Your obedience when it counts. Yeah. Keeping your vow when it hurts. He knows that you don't have what it takes, but he's promised to give you what it takes. Yeah. And he's doing it in here every day. When I look out and I see the dangs, how can I think of anything except a miracle five years in the making, walking around here as a pretty, pretty little Asian girl named Sarah? When I look out and see the Adormas, how can I think of anything except men who heard from God, women who heard from God, and they now hold in their hand the prize of an adopted son? Amen. Oh, saints... God has done marvelous things in our midst. We have a reason to trust him as our shield. This morning, we are taking up our shield. I can hear Moses encouraging the young Joshua in our midst with these words. It comes from Joshua 1.6. Be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. God didn't say you might. 
He didn't hedge his bet. He simply stated it as a fact. You will lead these people to inherit the land. That is beautiful for so many reasons. One is it was said through Moses who had failed to lead the people in the land. We're a church that believes the generation coming after us will surpass us. We have staked our lives upon it. We are not great sages lifted up on a stage. Our great contribution to the world is to be a footstool for your feet to stand on that you might reach higher into the heavens. In this congregation, we actually believe that we exist to prepare you for the ministry that God has for you. The reason that we call it life-changing ministries, plural, is we never intended for it to be singular in any way. Not singular in one leader. Not singular in one family. Not singular at all. We wanted a community of ministries. That vision has come true. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left that you may be successful in a few places. Successful where? Where? Come on, wherever. My teenagers love to say that. No, they say whatever. (laughs) God said wherever. Successful wherever you go. Do you know how I know we're going to take the region of Aswan? Because we're going to cling to the word of God. Do you know how I know we're going to see Teresa's eyes healed? Because we're going to be successful wherever we go. To others, they think it's arrogance or hubris. I say they simply have small faith. I trust my God. He is a shield from every attack of the enemy. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Oh, there is a tremendous point. How is it that a storefront church, actually, we were a living room church. Before that, we were a garage church. Storefront was a big move for us. Then two storefronts. Then a warehouse. Then three warehouses. Used to tell people when they say, what's the name of your ministry? So it was life-changing ministries. They say, oh, I think I've seen that. I bet you hadn't. (laughs) Are y'all over at the compact center? No, we're more of a compacted center. (laughs) You have to decide whether you want the favor of men or the favor of God. I will go anywhere that the Lord goes. We'll do anything that the Lord is doing. I want to say the things that he says. Our pride and our glory is his working among us. It is not our building. It is not our dress. It is not our finances. The only reason we discuss finances in this church is so that you know what we want to give away. Oh, these are things to be proud of. When you're surrounded by saints such as these, you ought to feel the confident desperation of Asa carrying you. Asa cried out to God and saw the destruction of the enemies of God. In 2 Chronicles 14, beginning in verse 10. I'll give you a second to get there. Say, there when there. 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 Asa went out to meet him. (laughs) He didn't stay home. He didn't go to a knitting party. He went out to meet him. And they took up battle positions in the valley of Zephathah near Merashah. Then Asa called to the Lord his God. Man, that is such a great battle plan. Show up, draw up lines, and call on God. 
How many of you have been on a missions trip with one of the three pastors? Now you can put your hands down. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand for this one. The most common question we get from first timers is what are we going to do? We're going to show up. We're going to draw a battle line. And we're going to call on God. That's true for every mission trip we've ever taken. It's true for every mission trip we'll ever take. There is no itinerary because we're not in charge. Our job is to show up, to draw up a battle line, and then to call on God. It's worked pretty well so far. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Don't you love that? We're like the little brother. We're picking a fight. We know we can't win because we're expecting big brother to show up and do all the work. That's right. I'm that guy. That's me. You might be able to take me, but you'll never take my daddy. See, when you have that kind of confidence, there was once a man that beat me so badly I lost memory of the day. He had the most annoying little brother. He became like nine feet tall after that. He'd stand at a distance, waggle his hips, point at me and say yucky things. Don't feel bad for me. I deserved every bit of it. Because he and I both knew he had his brother to fall on. I'm not scared to draw up battle lines because I always plan to fall at the feet of the Lord and say, I need you to do it again. And he does it again. Help us, O Lord, our God. For we rely on you, and in your name we have come against this vast army, O Lord. You are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. The Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah. The Cushites fled. You know, we have the prayer of Jabez popularized in the last decade. Why is the prayer of Asa not popularized? That's right. One is about gain, and the other is about give. And people, as much as they quote it this time of year, they don't understand that it is more blessed to give than to receive. In this church, surrounded by saints such as these, we admire men like Asa above men like Jabez because we didn't bring anything into the world, and we don't intend to take anything out of it. We're here to change this place. Like Abraham who believed and Joshua who trusted and advanced, Asa took his stand in his day and he struck down the enemy of his time. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 12. Where are the rest of you? When you're surrounded by saints such as these, you can't bring a little thin line Bible to a party like this. You got to pack much book. <laughs> oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. Sounds like he didn't have an itinerary either. But our eyes are on you. At LCM, we are not claiming to be something special. It is our dependency upon the Lord that gives us power. Our eyes are on Jesus, and he will show us what to do. Somebody say amen in the house of God. The idea that you must have it planned ahead of time is idolatrous. What you must do is be relying and dependent upon the Lord ahead of time. Look at verse 13. All the men of Judah with their wives and children... And little ones stood before the Lord. I understand the way that it looks. You see us standing in the face of the enemy. But more than that, we're standing in the face of our king. See, the enemy is there. But God is also there. So we don't fear the enemy because our king is there. It's not defiance that gives us strength. It is our submission to our father that gives us strength. Let me say that again for the uninitiated. While we may look defiant, that is not where our strength comes from. Our strength comes from our submission to our holy 
king, our father. He leads us. We are defiant in the face of the enemy because we are submissive to our father. Verse 14. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Beniah, the son of Jaleel, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. You're beginning to understand why Jews abbreviate things like Rashi. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. Somebody say, march down. March down. See, it's hard to win a victory sitting at home watching a soap opera. They will, <laughs> they will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. What a beautiful passage of Scripture. At LCM, we've learned the value of marching out, taking up our positions, standing firm, going out to face the enemy. Because God is in the battle, so must we be in the battle. Amen. Listen, saints, we do not dread it. We were built for it. Amen. We were called to it. Amen. And we were empowered for it. We will surely triumph over our enemy. Jehoshaphat, verse 18, bowed with his face to the ground. Man, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshipped before the Lord. Then some, somebody say some. some. Then some Levites from the Korathites and the Korites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Do you see it? Did you pick up on it? The king bowed and the priest stood. We must bow our decisions to the Lord and then stand up in the spirit and carry out his will. Oh, as you sit here today, do you have decisions as king of your house, king of your castle that you need to bow before the Lord? As a priest of God, must you then stand up and carry out his will? See, the man of God knows how to bow his decision, but stand up and carry out the Lord's will. You might need to bow so that you can stand. If you stand before you bow, that second bowing will not be pretty. We yield our direction to the king of kings. Jehoshaphat was a king in his own right, but the Lord is not the king of peasants. He's not the king of commoners. Isn't that right? Ludwig's in the lion heart. He's the king of kings. So kings bow before our God. We receive our direction from him. And then as priests, we stand up and carry out his will. When you're surrounded by saints such as these, how can we not excel? The answer is we are excelling. We must excel. We don't want to fall behind our godly brothers. We bow our decisions to the Lord. Then we stand up in the Spirit and carry out His commands. Verse 20. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in His prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him. Why did they praise him? For the trinkets they could get. For the gold dust that showed up. For the gold teeth that filled people's cavities. For the angel feathers that the weird old ladies danced around. Why did they praise him? For the splendor of his holiness. Before we read what they sang, notice they were not praising him for an outcome. God is not a cosmic genie here to do our will. 
We are his servants here to do what he has ordered us. They were praising him for the splendor of his holiness. Is holiness splendorous to you? Or is it restricting to you? Is holiness a burden to you? Or is holiness splendorous, glorious to you? When you're surrounded by saints such as these, you no longer see the commands of God as a burden. Instead, you see it as a beautiful act of love and devotion. It becomes full of splendor. He is holy. He is right in all that He does. We need to get on His side of things and trust Him. And then you know that you will be successful and you will be upheld. As surely as I stand here, Teresa will be healed. Those of you that are barren, serving God faithfully, and you want children, you can have them. We will fight for them, and we will get them. Amen. Those of you that are sick and need to be healed, if you are a servant of God, then the bread from the table is yours. You are not a dog begging for crumbs. We will be upheld. We bow our decisions before him. And then as priests, we stand up and carry out his commands. Today, tomorrow, or the next day, we will see victory. Amen. History has taught us this at LCM. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures for as long as your few minutes. Give thanks to the Lord, for His love endures forever. As they began to sing praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab the Mount, um, and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah and they were defeated. The men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men of Seir, they helped destroy one another. I've noticed nothing unites people faster than opposition to the righteous. But every once in a while, the dog shows his true character, doesn't it? Put a bowl of food out there, and they'll tear each other to pieces rather than share the bowl. So much of the opposition that you face will melt away in the face of any secondary gain for those that oppose you. They oppose you because your presence makes them feel guilty for the life that they're living. They oppose you because you accomplishing things in the Lord makes them feel guilty for sitting on their salvation, watching their blessed assurance grow wider. They oppose you because you make them feel guilty about the life that they are living. You know, they treated Jesus the same way. And he was not killed by wicked people in a brothel. He was killed in the religious capital of the world by the most religious people that ever lived on the most religious day of their year. See, nobody hates a Christian doing the will of the Lord quite like a religious man standing next to him because it proves that his religion and his philosophy is worthless. You can't be surprised at the opposition that you face. You can't even be discouraged by it. You should take it as a badge of honor that you're on the right track. Amen. There is one that you ought to work for his praise. And he is all the more willing to give it to you. He proved it when he credited you with righteousness. Now the things that are praiseworthy are the extent to which you can lose your life to grab hold of his. Amen. Verse 24 when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert. Man, I love that place. A desert is a dry killing field. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. The desert is a thirsty place, a burning place. But every once in a while you come to the place that overlooks it. That can see beyond it. That goes other side that knows what's on the back side. Moses had to cross a desert to meet with God. It was on the back side of the desert that he saw the burning bush. Sometimes, saints, we got to come to the place where we can overlook the desert because you might see victory on the other side. Can you feel victory on the other side, saints? And he looked towards the vast army 
They saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. When you come to the place where you can see over the desert, there's a victory on the other side. This is why every now and then we ought to look back at the victory with Goliath's sword. We are to pick up Samson's disposable jawbone. We need to go back for a seaside resort between the devil and the deep blue sea where you last crossed. Sometimes we just need to hold up the standard of the Lord and say, look at the marvelous things that he has done. It's not an excuse to rest. It's the fuel to keep going. Today as we're surrounded by saints such as these, let us come to the place that overlooks our desert. Come on, saints. I'm beginning to see victory again. Amen. Lift up your eyes and come to the place that overlooks the desert. Is the desert your situation that never seems to change? Is the desert your relatives that never seem to change? What kind of desert are you facing? Because we got to come to the place where you can see the stars and not the sand. You can overlook the sand and see the victory on the other side. It's time. We've been given every reason to trust Him. The men throughout history that have prevailed with the Lord against the assaulting challenges of their day have all done it in the exact same way. Let's turn to Psalm 37 and we'll see how they've done it. When you get to Psalm 37, pick up with me in verse 3. Psalm 37 is an acrostic poem. That means that when you... Oh, we have a slide that tells you what that means. An acrostic is a poem or other form of writing in which the first letter, syllable, or word of each line, paragraph, or other reoccurring feature in the text spells out a word or message. The idea here is that when you're looking at Psalm 37, there are sets of verses. And with every set of verses... There's a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet that begins the line. It's an aid to memorizing, but it's also layers of meaning. And I'm going to show you that. When we look at verse 3, which says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. There are so many levels of meaning to this that it would be easy to read over and not notice them. To begin with, verse 3 begins with a bet. A bet in Hebrew is, is a pictograph. The bet looks a little bit like the floor plan to a tent. And it has the connotation of a home or a house. Can you all see that in the bottom right-hand corner of the blue box? That's a bet as Moses wrote it. The bet in the upper left-hand corner is as a modern typewriter would write it. The letters change them through the years. Since the bet has the connotation of a house, it comes from the first word in verse 3, which is trust. To say trust in Hebrew is bata. That's Strong's number 982, bata. Can you see it on your screen? Let me say this. Trust in the Lord, bata in the Lord, and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Bata has to do with trusting, of course, confidence, safety, and security. Specifically, do you see the underlying phrase? When one can rely on someone or something else, it is used to show us trust in God. Since a bet looks like a house, and it comes in the section of Psalm 37 that is dedicated to the letter bet, which looks like a house, it makes sense then that Psalm 37, 3 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Have your safety, your confidence, your security in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and he will give you safe pasture. Where do sheep live? In a pasture. And a safe pasture is what you would want if you're a sheep. But you're not actually a sheep. You live in homes. If you want to build a home that is safe, that is guarded by a shepherd. If you want to live inside of Psalm 23, the way that you do that is you bata. To build a house, you have to learn to put your trust in the Lord, your confidence in the Lord, your safety in the Lord, your security in the Lord. 
How many of you in here are building houses? By building a house, I mean this as a family line, a family name. Yes, I thought many more of you were building houses than your hands went up. You bunch of literal people. <laughs> Greeks, every one of you. If you really want to build a house, you have to do it through the expression of godly confidence, safety that comes from knowing you're where God has said for you to be, security because God is with you. You have to display trust in the Lord and do good. Bata builds the house. Does that make sense? Let's go to verse 4. In verse 4, it says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The word delight in Hebrew is anag. It's still under the heading of bet. In this case, it's still in that part of the stanza of the poem. Delight has an interesting connotation to it. If you ever had to sit down and define the word delight in English... That might be difficult for you. Thank God for Merriam-Webster, right? Delight for you just means like pleasantness. But the word behind it in Hebrew means to be happy. That's why we say delight. Soft or pliable. Come on now. Pliable. Well, we're talking about building houses. If you have to make something that's curved, you, you can't use a two by six. You have to find something like plywood, right? You need something that is pliable, something that can curry. Any of you were skaters back in the day? Forgive me, I used to beat people like you up. <laughs> Unless you had a skateboard. And then I made nice, quick, right? Skateboard's a deadly weapon in the hand of an angry, uh, disaffected young man. Um, a half pipe made of plywood, right? Because it needs to bend. See... When we say delight yourself in the Lord, we're missing something here. What does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord? It means you're happy with whatever he's doing. What does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord? It means that you're soft in his hands. What does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord? It means that you're pliable enough that any which way he bends you is pleasant to you. Oh, come on now. Do you want to delight yourself in the Lord? What does it mean to, to get the desires of your heart? What an interesting thing. This word for desires of your heart, misala, <laughs> a feminine noun indicating a petition or a request. Look at the highlighted portion. A plea for victory over one's evil enemies. Saints, I don't make this up. This is the complete word studies definition. It's a plea for victory over one's evil enemies. Let's put that together. If you can remain pliable before the Lord, if you are happy with whatever He is doing, if you are soft in His hands, He will give you the plea for victory over your enemy that is in your heart. Amen. Oh, that's good news. Yeah. Say, so, well, I don't know why I'm not prevailing. Maybe you need to become more pliable. When you're surrounded by saints such as these, there's examples everywhere. You can look and see that Mr. Charlie could have done anything he wanted to. But he moves closer and closer to the church. He's paying two mortgages right now just to be nearer to what's happening on Forte Drive. If that's not pliable, I don't know what is. When you look at Baj Erigina, a man that could have done anything he wanted anywhere in the world that he wanted. But what makes him happy is to have a life with room margins at the edge to make time to give your children Spanish lessons, to make time to see the generations of his family planted in foreign lands, to do marriage counseling for you. See, happy, soft, pliable. This allows you victory over your enemies. How do I know that Teresa will be healed? Because the Vincents are pliable in the Lord's hand. Whatever he shows the... If the Lord tells Brent to shave his head with a sword, then Brent will go buy a sword, just like Ezekiel did. Pliable before the Lord. When you're surrounded by saints such as these, 
You learn to win. You build a winning culture. And our church is kicking down the gates of hell at every turn. Amen. Verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him and he will do this. This is a new section in the acrostic. This section is a gimel. The gimel looks a little bit like a foot. Do you see in the top left-hand corner, the book script? It actually looks like a woman's boot to me. But that's not what was written here. In David's day, when this psalm was written, it looked more like that check mark in the bottom right-hand corner. It was to symbolize a foot. It meant you're gathering or walking. The whole section under this has to do with how you gather, how you walk out the Lord's commands. That's a very interesting thing because it comes from the word galel, which is our next, there we go. Galel, a verb meaning to roll. Back in 9-11, somebody decided that they weren't going down without a fight. The expression that was assigned to that was, let's roll. Well, God says, let's roll. Amen. When you see the word commit, it's actually galel. In Hebrew, it means to commit, to trust, to roll. The idea has to do with <laughs> rolling stones. Not the old man that looks like somebody's grandma in tights. <laughs> Actual stones that are rolling, right? Now, think about what that means. Once a stone is in motion rolling, how much control does it have over itself? It's kind of an inanimate object, right? The idea is that you hopelessly fling yourself down the hill in the direction that God says, and you just go where he says to go. To commit yourself means that you lose all inhibition. It means that you lose all control, all direction. Man, that's also soft and pliable, isn't it? That's also completely trusting, isn't it? See, all three of these words are related. How do you build the house that he's saying? How do you get safety, confidence? How do you do that? You remain soft and pliable. He will give you victory over your enemy. How do I walk that out? You fully commit to what the Lord is saying. Somebody say, fully commit. Fully commit. We have to roll in the direction that God is saying go no matter what man says, no matter what your flesh says. You roll when he says to roll. Let's roll. <laughs> to commit your way to the Lord is demonstrated practically by how you walk. Rolling in the direction of the Lord is an exciting thing. Think of what it's caused in our lives in the last year. All of the international trips, all of the baptisms in the Holy Ghost, all of the miracles, these come when you have the slightest inclination, the slightest push, and you say, I'm just going to roll with it. Come on, somebody say roll with it. I don't know why that's so pleasant to my ear. Let's look at Psalm 37 together as a kind of amplified slide. So when you see it as it's written in the NIV on the left, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. I'm suggesting that everybody that ever overcame in the Lord did it by trusting or relying, becoming secure or confident in the Lord and doing good. Dwelling in the land and enjoying safe pasture, meaning that their home was characterized by reliance on the Lord, security and confidence. Isn't that what you're aiming for? Man, so many in here have made so much progress to that. When you're surrounded by saints such as these, you're being taught by your very environment, even if the teacher is absent. Verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. This means delight, be happy, soft, pliable in whatever the Lord is doing, and He will give you your victorious plea. Oh, man, does that sound good to you? Your victorious plea. This means that when you're crying out against an enemy, you must also have to know whatever God says, I'm rolling with it. Whatever way he bends me, that's what I'm doing. My safety, my security, it comes from him. Do you have a giant that you're trying to kill? Make sure that you are pliable in your battle plan. 
Make sure that all of your trust is in the Lord. You haven't hedged your bet with an insurance company, a doctor, or a medical plan. Make sure that you are rolling in the direction that God has said to roll and you're not fighting to go uphill from the direction he told you to go. When you think about things like this, commit or rolling, walking with the Lord is trusting him and he will accomplish his will in your life. How many of you believe that your brothers sitting around you are in the will of God? Raise your hand if you can see somebody who's doing the will of God in here. Wow. We'll pray for healing for two or three of you because you can't see. Look at this, saints. When you're surrounded by saints such as these, you're spurred on to righteousness. Do you feel spurred on? Yes. In Hebrews 12, look at verse 1. Therefore, I wait for you to get there. Two of you are there. Everybody, Hebrews 12. <clears throat> Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Cloud of witnesses. See, we are here today surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Those in the past, but also those who are present right now. When I look at Justin Linton's smiling face, it reminds me that I'm not supposed to be quite as serious as I am. When I feel apathetic and I look at Abimbola, it reminds me that I'm supposed to take things more seriously than I do. <laughs> Lately, every time I turn around, Rob has been there. And I'm thankful for that. Rob doesn't like his nickname, which is incognito. I thought Rob was hiding from someone when he came to our church. He always had on glasses and a hat, and then he's got this beard that looks like he glued it on. So I started calling Rob incognito. But then Abimbola started wearing a hat like a redneck. Flannels. Said he was cold and I started calling him incognito. <laughs> Look, when you're surrounded by saints such as these, everywhere you go, you ought to see something worth emulating. Everywhere you go, you ought to be spurred on towards righteousness. I am. When, I, when I'm down, when I don't know what else to do, I do two things. I open the Word and then I think about your lives because God has done marvelous things in our midst. Amen. The Lord's hand is lifted high. The Lord has triumphed over enemies. The men and women in Hebrews 11 that are the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12, they've run their race. Theirs is behind them. Much of ours is behind us, but much more is still ahead of us. The thing to remember is that the people in Hebrews 11 Hall of Fame, they're our brothers. We're of the same family. They're not some special class of the unobtainable. Their lives look like our lives, and our lives are beginning to look like theirs. We are them, and they are us. Their deeds are memorialized in the faith and yours are recorded in the heavens. Even if you manage to slip through this life in a relatively obscure fashion, surely the disciples that you raise up will catch the king's attention. See, you raise a righteous son, you've become immortal. As I remind you about these men, remember, they often stood alone. They were not benefited by a church like this. In other words, they were not surrounded by saints such as these. So when you hear that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see, that this is what the ancients were commended for, it's also what you're being commended for. 
when a 44-year-old bachelor walks in our church and says, I'm just glad if he'll save me. I don't expect him to ever do another thing for me. And some man of God looks at him and says, you know what? I see you with a wife and two sons. He says, Pastor, you don't know who I am and you don't know my background, but for many reasons, that's not possible. And he sits here today with a wife and two sons. Is that not calling the things that are not as though they were? If there was ever a man that I didn't think had a potential for marriage, every time I see the Fowler household, I celebrate miracles. <laughs> Smiley's character lit alive with the Holy Ghost. And Brandon began to shine just a little brighter because if he didn't, she wasn't going to give him a chance. There are miracles all around us. And for that brother and that sister to produce a grandchild like Elijah, oh, saints, look around you. There are 12 names that I'm going to rattle through. And they come from Hebrews 11. You can follow along if you want, but I mostly want you to listen. And listen for the things that you learned in Psalm 37. The first one. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice. See, Abel delighted in God's way without revision. Soft, pliable. What you want, Lord, that's what I'm going to do. Cain needed to add to what God said or take away from it or manipulate it. He's definitely not rolling in God's direction. He's doing what he wants to do. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life. How committed was Enoch rolling in the way the Spirit was leading without deviation? He was so close to God that God said, I'd rather have you closer to me. By faith, Noah, when warned about the things yet not seen in holy fear, built an ark. He found his safety and his security in God. He built a home defined by it. Do you hear it? He trusted him. By faith, Abraham, when called to go committed himself to roll with God. The brother crossed deserts and rivers, foreign tribes of every kind. How committed was he? He was rolling with God. He's the original holy roller. <laughs> By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. He was pliable. He was ha happy. He was soft. He delighted in blessing those God blessed. Amen. Oh, man. Isaac blessed the second born. Pliable, doing what God wants, putty in God's hands. Not putting in God's hands, putty. By faith, Joseph spoke about the exodus and gave instructions about his bones. You want to say he trusted God? That he found his security, that he was confident? The only thing the man cared about was what you did with his bones 400 years after he died. How confident is that in the resurrection? By faith, Moses' parents rejected the king's edict. They were fully committed, rolling in the way the Lord wanted them to go, even at the cost of their lives. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as a son of Egypt. See, he delighted in, he was happy with what God had promised. He didn't want what the world could give him. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea. They trusted, they found their confidence in, and they committed and rolled in the way of the Lord. See, there was no turning back, no plan B. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. Man, did the people have to trust? Did they have to find all of their security in the Lord and His plans that built the house of Israel? By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed. And Rahab was so rolling with God so committed to him that her own people would have killed her if God didn't come through. She would have been hung as a spy. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, all the prophets trusted, delighted, and were committed. Their homes were dedicated and their ways dedicated to the Lord. How do we do what we do? We trust in, we delight in, and we fully commit to the ways of our King. Somebody say amen. amen. Their accomplishments have been placed in the holy writ. They're recorded as follows. 
who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, weaknesses turned to strength, becoming powerful in battle, routing foreign armies, received back dead, raised to life, tortured and refused to be released for a better resurrection, faced jeers and floggings, chained, put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword, and the world wasn't worthy of them. That passage closes like this, verse 39. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Our list is beginning to look like their list. We have a ways to go. But when you're surrounded by saints such as these, how could we do anything but be confident that we're going to arrive? Amen. Saints, I've heard all of my life, I want to be a part of a New Testament church. We're living out the life of the New Testament believers right now. Amen. The same way they did, founded on the Older Testament. In what way could we be considered deficient is it through miracles man how many people have been healed in this church if you know of somebody actually documented full-time healed in this church raise your hand if you know that look at that is it in revelation you think the 1100 published messages online contain no revelation in what way would we be inferior well, maybe people don't prefer the saints that they can see, touch, and feel to the ones that they can fantasize about in the past. Do you really think Paul didn't eat a kind of food that you don't like? Do you really think that Silas didn't have any clothes that are not the kind that you would wear? See, the thing is, is we may just be a little too ordinary for some. And I can live with that because they had the same problem with Jesus. If the problem people have with me is the problem that they had with Jesus, then I would say we're in good company. I'm going to take solace in the fact that the finest men I've ever known in Matthew Piro, in Wade Sutherland, in Bajer Regina, in Charlie Brown, haven't given up on what we're doing, but are encouraged by it, that something's wrong with the rest of the world, not us. Amen. When I look in the back of the church and I see that Gene Piro who has lived almost eight decades, although he looks like he's 45, <laughs> is still with us, loves us, supports us. Man, when you're surrounded by saints such as these, how can we not succeed? I have two more scriptures to show you. And uh, I think that they're worth seeing, and we'll do them quickly, but you're going to want to hear them. Are you ready? The first is a slide so that you'll know the word you're about to encounter. Hupamone, Strong's number 5281. It refers to that quality of character which does not allow one to surrender to circumstance or succumb under trial. Come on, somebody say quality of character. Quality of character. See, this is the kind of saint that the book of Revelation speaks about in the 14th chapter and the 12th verse. This calls for patient endurance. This calls for hupomone, the kind of character that just won't quit on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Right blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Saints, if you have the kind of character that won't quit, like the saints that surround you do, then the things that you accomplish for the Lord will be written in the heavens forever. Do you want to come to nothing? Or do you want to have deeds that are recorded forever? If you're like me, one of the larger struggles in your life is, is there significance in what feels like the mundane? There is significance in every act of obedience, every step that you take, 
every single tear that you shed for the gospel, there is significance in. When you're surrounded by saints such as these, you ought to feel treasured. You ought to feel important. The very Spirit of God is residing in our midst. That is an incredible blessing. It brings us to our last scripture. It was our scripture of the day in the church. It is Luke 9, 51. This is where we close. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven. That's a nice way to say that, isn't it? What had to happen before he could be taken up to heaven? There had to be a crucifixion. There had to be a trial. He had to see many turn their back on him. He had to see a nation say, let his blood be on our heads and the heads of our children. He had to see wickedness in the highest ranks of the temple. He had to see Gentile dogs surround him and pierce him with a spear. There are so many things that go before taken up to heaven. But as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus set, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. As I looked at this today in the Greek, it's so beautiful, it tells us exactly what to do. On the left side of your screen, you can see autos. This is translated he, but it can mean he, himself, or his. Then you see uh, prosopon. It is translated as face, but it means specific part of your face. It's your eye sockets and your brow. Then you see uh, another version of autos here that is translated he, himself, or his. And then steadfastly set. This is interesting. What is translated steadfastly set actually means resolutely turn in a direction. Get this. When Jesus realized that his time is short, his brow, he resolutely turned in the direction of the goal, which was Jerusalem. He literally took his face, turned it towards where he wanted to go, and he set it in that direction. Isn't this what Hebrews tells us to do? Yes. Fix your eyes, your eye sockets, your forehead, your brow upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who endured such scorn. Saints, we need to do a few things. One is, we need to take a step up to the line and face that enemy that is trying to keep you from having kids. Another, we need to march out against the sickness that is occurring in this room. Another, we need to sacrificially meet the needs of the saints in India. We need today to resolutely set our face in the direction that God has told us is the goal. And you know what? We will triumph over our enemy. As we stand to our feet, let's do that now.